Um, before I even talk, I wanted to just cue on something that Molly just said. Two of the strongest metrics in people resolving musculoskeletal injuries are, do you like your job? And how's your home life? Two of the strongest. Every single patient gets asked those two questions. And it's amazing when you ask those questions. You can almost tell before you ask the questions what the answers are going to be. And it's pretty cool. Anyway, um, we're going to talk about some two or three really simple things that have to do with manual medicine and the brain. And I'm going to try and do all this here. It's my first PowerPoint presentation, so I'm going to do a really good job. I had a um, family friend, Wesley Hunter, who was an orthopedic surgeon here in Santa Rosa back in the 70s. And um, when my dad found out I was going to go to chiropractic school, he asked Wes, he said, um, what do you think about that? And Wes said, well, he said that. He said, I, th I think they're onto something, but I think that what they think they're doing is really not what they're doing, but they're getting some results. And so, you know, of course, my dad tells me that before I go to school. And uh, so I chewed on that for a long time, and I've been chewing on it until really recently. And preparing for this talk, it really helped me get a little inkling of something that's a clarity on possibly what's going on beyond um, a vertebra being over here at a place, pushing on a nerve like you're stepping on a garden hose, and then you shift it back into place, and then all of a sudden everything's good, because that's really not what's happening. And. Uh, Manual medicine encompasses chiropractic care, osteopathic medicine, massage, physical therapy, Feldenkrais. All these, all these forms, and there's other ones as well, basically are after the same thing in a certain way. They're after releasing somatized stress that's gotten stuck on our body. Could be from an injury, could be from a fall, could be from enduring a bad relationship, it could be listening to the news. All those things have the same thing, right? They make you feel like this. And what we want you to feel like is like this. And so that's so much of, if any of you have ever had a massage, um, had any of those types of therapies, what do you generally feel like when you get done? You feel, you feel good. You feel like you're clear-headed, you're moving better, you feel happy, you feel uplifted. And that's really what um, I think it's about. And the effects of those things on, especially on our spine, have a lot to do with our general sense of well-being. So anyway, this question of what is really happening when you work with someone's spine has been a long-standing question. Some pretty smart people were thinking about it a long time ago. Long time ago. And in fact, most cultures on the planet, most continents, have had something to do with it. It's like people it's probably as long as there's been people with spines, people have tried to help each other with their spines. And it was intuitive, it was organic, it was, um, it was experiential, it wasn't scientific, it was just something that was kind of understood, and so it has bred a lot of craziness as well. But it's something that has endured. And um, there's an old, Scottish bone setter there on the bottom. He's really doing that thing, isn't he? Anyway, and you know, people have written about it. And one of the common things with this kind of era, this earlier era in uh, European medicine, some of the people were saying, some of the, the medical doctors were saying, well, let's not, let's not throw the whole th baby out with the bathwater with this manual medicine thing, you know? They're getting some results we we're not getting. How can we? figure it out. And so it got kind of quantified and codified, a lot of it with the beginning of osteopathy in this country on the turn of the century, the beginning of chiropractic around the turn of the century, of organizing it. A medical doctor named Syriax was real involved in England, setting up a lot of structure to organizing it and bringing it more in a more refined way forward. So. That wouldn't be a chiropractic talk if you didn't see that picture, right? <laughs> so here's just a little reminder. There's your spine, stack of bones. The thing I tell my patients is one of my jobs is 
the first thing I tell my patient is, remember our relationship. You're the boss and I'm the hired help. And that's our relationship. It's the only relationship we're ever going to have. So anything I do has got to be on your permission. So if I'm going to touch your body, if I'm going to put energy into your body, it's because we have an agreement that that's what's going to happen. So the whole stage starts getting set then for suppleness and for the ability to receive something. And I think that's a real big part of kind of what Molly was addressing, that there's so many other factors involved in the healing experience. So anyway, there's a spinal cord. It's, just, it's kind of like the mast. Keeps everything together, and it protects the central nervous system, the spine anyway, and the cranium protects the brain. And there's all the nerves, and you can see things coming off and going everywhere, and then you can see the representations of the nerves. Oh, I can just look right here. Um, all the representations of the nerves, how they come out to the body and the dermatomes, where you get sensations. If you get a pinched nerve in a certain spot, you can get a numbness in another spot, and you can kind of tell where that was coming from. So that's a good thing to, to just kind of see that integration, it's all hooked together. And a lot of what we're going to talk about is when there is, I'm going to try and use the pointer now. There is, it is. So this is called a motion segment. That vertebra and that vertebra together. And these joints back here that have been cut away so you can see the spinal column, spinal cord. So when in a normal reality, when you bend, or you bend, everything goes. Everything moves. Everything take, takes a certain percentage of a direction one way or the other. It's smooth. In a spine that has adhesions and that it's fixated and has taken some compressive energy, many times those facet joints that I just had the marker on get stuck. And so you go to bend, and part of your spine bends, and then part of you is stuck, and it moves as a block. And that sends errant impulses to the brain, the proprioceptive impulses, the impulses of how you're moving in space going up to the motor cortex. So when they get stuck, many times they're inflamed, and many times people that come in with back problems, they're very stuck and they're very inflamed. And honestly, most people that see me say, I have pain in my neck, I have pain in my back, or I have headaches. I mean, that's like most of my work. And so what happens is what we want to do is because the spine is so involved in innervating everything, that the, the energy coming through the spinal cord is involved in, in innervating everything, we want that to be as smooth as possible. Okay? And everything wants to flow and it wants the information coming from the organs, from the joints, and from the spine up to the brain should be appropriate to what that structure is hardwired to understand how to do and then sent back out to get appropriate responses. And so this is this other one over here on the side is more of that, the look of that kind of track coming up from a muscle or from a joint up into the brain and then back down again. So what happens is when normal healthy, and a normal healthy person that has no adhesions or restrictions in their spine, and they're moving freely, they're relaxed, the brain has a proper stimulation for what's called brain neurotrophic factors. And brain-derived neurotrophic factors would be the more accurate way. I should open a note, but I don't think I'm going to. So that keeps the brain healthy. You're moving freely. You're relaxed. You're moving freely. If you're really stressed out or if you're really in a lot of pain, your cortisol levels go up. And that actually suppresses brain-derived neurotrophic factors and makes the brain suppressed. And so, so much of manual medicine, what we're finding is, is to get people out of pain, number one, and then reestablish normal movement in the spine, and then reestablish normal movement and proprioception through the whole body. Because what happens when you hurt your back? I just hurt, I just hurt my back. I had an old weightlifting injury, so I, when I found out I was doing this, getting ready to do this thing, I was like, oh, my back. So I'm walking around. I'm thinking, this is perfect. I'm going to do this talk. And I'm walking around back, you know. And, and then I'm thinking, well, I'm really going to get a lot out of this. Since I'm in this situation, I'm just going to lean into and get a lot out of it. And I started realizing how much... Um, the rest of my body got involved in the program and started moving weird. You know, I'm no longer just kind of easy going guy. I'm all locked up. And so every joint and every muscle group is sending these weird impulses to my brain. 
And what happens is if that goes on long enough, your brain gets smudged. And for those of you who are physicians and smarty pants, you know, medical people in this room, I've got a ton of references that you can get. You just need to write a note on the little three by five card, and I'm gonna show you some in a little bit. But they're literally, in the last 10 years, all this stuff has come to light for manual medicine. It's amazing. So anyway, so what you want to do is you want to normalize the brain drive neurotrophic factors in the brain so the brain stays healthy and you want to remove any of the smudging that comes from getting a whole bunch of weird information from how you're moving through space and you want to reestablish normal movement and normal energy coming from the brain out. And so how you do that is this. You free up the spine and then you do functional fitness movements. You do things that have to do with balance, lots and lots of balance exercises. And that puts a flood of proprioceptive information into the brain and it stimulates brain-derived neurotrophic factors so that your brain becomes more youthful, okay? And so that's really what my job in manual medicine is. And since the brain becomes more youthful and gets out of its stress pattern and it's related to everything else, then other things happen and that's part of what I think Hippocrates and maybe Wes Hunter were talking about that we don't, you know, we're, maybe we need to figure out. And I'm going to tell you about a patient now because this is the perfect moment. I don't really like this slide, so I'm not going to use it too much. But um, this is a, one saying there's a joint dysfunction in the spine. And this is kind of the cycle of nerve flow into the brain coming out with aberrant function. And this is the same cycle, but with a restored, through manipulative therapy, a restored movement in a motor section or a motion segment in the spine to normal function. So anyway, it's kind of a boring one. But um, those two things we were just talking about, smudging the brain and prematurely aging the brain. Pain, chronic pain, and, um, and dysfunction in the physical form prematurely ages the brain. And so, and you see this, you see this a lot with with older people, I'm going to say older people, elders that have fallen or gotten hurt, okay, they've gotten fall, they've gotten hurt, they've fallen, they've gotten hurt, they're, um, they were sedentary for a while, they're trying to get back on their feet, and they're afraid. Their muscles have atrophied a little bit, and they move like this, right? They don't want to take any risks, no risk, no, this isn't going to happen, it's not going to happen. So, what happens with that is that they're not getting much juice to the brain from their body anymore. So it's getting, it's withering up there. And the, if they were in chronic pain for a very long time, one of the studies that you're going to see later said that six months of chronic low back pain, or six months of low back pain that's strong, like a seven out of 10, or in that realm, ages the brain 10 years. It shrinks. And so you want to get them out of pain and you want to get proper nerve impulses going to the brain and then you want to stabilize the brain and the body with with exercises balance exercises and that's really the essence of this whole talk are those two things get everything moving and get the brain stimulated and that makes for the most useful brain so um, I'm gonna talk about two two patients right now a 13 year old rock climber falls in the gym 12 feet down hits his head and um, you know, tra minor traumatic brain injury, loses personality, shifts, can't sleep, short-term memory loss, all the, you know, the things that go with that. Comes in, um, he's working with one of our Sutter uh, neurologists as well, we're communicating, and I'm doing some cranial work, which we're not gonna talk about tonight, and some other things to get stress out of his body. And he's progressing in a fairly linear fashion, just progressing over about a six, seven week, eight week period. And then I read a paper about um, uh, brain-derived neurotrophic factor and this balance exercise thing. So I said, well, I've known about it, but I've never really thought about it like this. So I said, well, why don't you get a slack line, you know, climb, you know a slack line? A slack line is a tightrope. It's about that high off the ground, about two feet off the ground, that cl rock climbers and people that uh, do that kind of thing like to have. So he strung a slack line, his mom went, went to REI and they got the thing and they strung it in the backyard. Him and his sister started walking on it every day. I saw him a week later. It was like he went linear and then he went exponential. I mean, in one week, he got better than he did 
And some of it could be the process of the resolution of traumatic brain injury. There can be some exponential moments in it. But in this case, I just felt like, I feel like it was the slack line that helped them so much. So that's one. And then I was thinking about this talk today, and I had a patient come in uh, on Tuesday. And she had neck pain since April, low back pain for four weeks. She was in the emergency department a week ago for a morphine shot because she was in intractable low back pain. She's been on four doses of ibuprofen and muscle relaxants now for three weeks. She wasn't even on that before she went to the emergency room. And um, infraorbital pattern to a headache, which was kind of curious. And then uh, chronic constipation, constipation for 10 years. She was in two or three motor vehicle accidents 10 or 12 years ago. So I saw her Tuesday and examined her and released all the fixations in her spine and did some myofascial work and you know, gave her lots of love, like uh, Molly said. And uh, she comes in today. And I said, and she started telling me what she's doing. She's just glowing. And I thought, oh, this is interesting. So she's glowing. She says, I have so much joy. And I said, really? And I said, well, how's your, how's your pain? She goes, well, it's about 75% better, which you know, is, is great. We always go for that big win in manual medicine. But that's, that's, pretty, that's substantial in two days. And I haven't taken any pain meds. So that's another big win. And I pooped on Tuesday, Wednesday, and I pooped today. <laughs> and I didn't take any stool softeners. And so I thought, well, here's my talk. That's it, done. That's what Hippocrates is talking about. He is talking about tend to the spine because it has, can have the root in other, other diseases and other problems in the body. And I think that the far-reaching effect of a freely moving, functional, proper energy going to the brain spine and uh, its response, a healthy brain, can then healing can happen in a lot of other ways and other, other systems. So that was my uh, constipation story. <laughs> so here are some of the kind of articles. Spine Magazine, 2011. Journal of Electromyography uh, my and Kinesiology, 2012. Um, Manual Therapy, Journal of Neuroscience, Clinical Neurophysiology. These are all real deal articles that talk about what we're talking about tonight. It's just not like new age chiropractic. This is just the thing that's being brought to our attention. You know, neurophysiological effects of spinal manipulation. Now this last one, the role of motor learning and neuroplasticity in design. We didn't really talk about that tonight, but in, order, in addition to the brain aging and the brain getting smudged, the thing where we like to talk about adaptive neuroplasticity or normal neuroplasticity, meaning that your brain is, is naturally normally responding to it in its environment. Easy. And when you send a bunch of weird impulses up to it for a long period of time, it gets smudged, and then you get a maladaption. The brain gets so that it's kind of muddled, and we don't want that. And so a lot of ways of clearing the mind and making the brain healthier and stronger. One is what we've been talking about, and the other one is functional fitness. And that is, I put all these pictures up here um, very late last night, and they're very low res, and thank you, Finn, again, for saving me. But um, like the difference between riding an exercise cycle and riding a mountain bike, tremendous difference. One is locked in space, and all you have to do is do one thing. The other one is constantly changing and moving, so your whole nervous system is having to adapt every second to what's going on. Really powerful, stimulates the brain. Stand up paddling, skiing, weight training, where you're doing all kinds of different movements. Here, this picture on the bottom here, this guy's weight training. You wouldn't think this is too important or functional fitness, but he's using one dumbbell. I mean, he might have another one over there, but for the purposes of this, <laughs> he's using one. Because you're, using, you're doing a unilateral thing, so guess what's happening? The whole kinetic chain from the top of your head to the bottom of your feet is having to figure out how to be stable. Fantastic. Do it on the other side. Do it when you're balancing. I saw a guy in Ash at the gym in Ashland about two years ago, and I was working out, and this guy gets up on a hard medicine ball this big, stands on it, and starts doing a dumbbell workout. And I thought, 
that guy's brain is about as juicy as a brain can get. I mean, he's just happening. He's so happy. Anyway, so that's, um, so we got Tai Chi. So 3 million people in America are doing Tai Chi. 30 million of people in America are doing yoga right now. And one thing they, all, they both have in common is a lot of neuroadaptive, a lot of proprioceptive information, a lot of balance exercises keeps the brain young. There's tons of articles on yoga and Tai Chi for youthful brain, preventing Alzheimer's, preventing dementia, big. So a little bit more different things that kind of look like that. And then uh, since I've run so long, I'm going to not do one other thing that I was gonna do, but the whole talk tonight is about balance. And the lifestyle is the most important one. I had a teacher one time who said, the only teeth you need to floss are the ones you want to keep. <laughs> That's it. It says it right there. The only part of your spine you want to take care of is the part you want to work right. The only part, I mean, muscle group in your body you want to be strong is the muscle group in your body that you want to work right. It's kind of like, take care of it and um, it will take care of you in a whole different way. And that <clears throat> getting outside of your comfort zone, I tell people a lot of times, get your back adjusted, find a chess partner, and go to yoga class. Stimulate your brain, stimulate your brain, stimulate your brain to stay young and active and healthy. And those things are really important. So anyway, that is, um, that's my talk. Thank you.